So, um, first, just uh, thank you for the uh, for the opportunity to come back. Always happy to uh, to come back into town. Um, I was making the joke that uh, if we had one more senior faculty member, we could recreate my thesis defense. <laughs> um, so, if anybody knows where Ken Wise is before dinner, let me um, let us let us know. He's around. Yeah, I, I hear I hear he's around too. So um, I want to talk a little bit about this, this, um, uh, this, basically this experiment that we, we literally started the day I walked in the door at the University of Illinois in 2010 to try to take um, initially the, the enterprise of computing, but more lately the enterprise of computing and data wide um, across the curriculum. And I, I, several people have asked me how I was gonna, how I was gonna do this, and I said, well, I was just gonna do some truth in labeling. So this is an Illinois um, initiative. If I was really being accurate, the slides would all look like this. This would, you know, this would be the title. Life is too short for me to rebuild every PowerPoint slide on the, power, on the, on the, pit, on the pit stuff. So I said, I'm going to ask for forgiveness in advance. All of my pronouns are going to be off. The they's versus the we's versus the us's, they're all gonna be screwed up. Just, you know, just, just kind of work with me. So, I mean, you know, we start with just the, the macroscopic context, which is certainly in, you know, in computer science, you know, they're all coming in the front door. We have no lack of demand for people who are interested to be in, in computer science. This is a particular graph we started building um, um, a while ago. Um, at the University of Illinois, you apply to the College of Engineering and then you declare your favorite major, the thing you want to be in. And so this is a plot of all of the majors desired by applicants over the last decade um, or so, and you'll note that they add up, well, you'll note that they're percentages, okay? So all of these percentages add up to 100. Those of you with a background in statistics will, will notice something that technologists refer to as a pattern, okay? Here, there's this giant orange bar um, that's crushing you know, all of the other applications. It's, it's close to, four, I don't have the, the 2007, it's close to 40% right, of, um, of all the applications. And I know that this diagram has very, been very successful because lately if you go to Ed Lazowska's front page of UW, this picture is now there, okay? I, after the, the month after I shared this with Ed, it showed up on the UW front page. So this is an exciting time to be doing, to be doing computer science, but you know, there are some issues. There's a classical set of institutional responses right, um, to, these, to these kinds of problems. The first one was the 1.0, ah, ha, ha. I, I saw this before, <laughs> okay, fool me once, this is it's just an internet bubble, stop bothering me, right, then there's a second response that says, okay, it appears to be a little bit more than the bubble, maybe some TAs, okay, maybe, okay, maybe some TAs. And you should be thankful for them. And you should be thankful for them, <laughs> okay, thanks dad. And then, right, okay, okay, maybe, Maybe a few more, okay, maybe a few more faculty lines, right? And then, you know, we crush through that. And then it's like, uh-oh, right? Now, you know, now what's going on, right? And so this is just, you know, some more macroscopic stuff. This is, so this is what CS majors look like, right? Um, um, and the bars on the right-hand side, those are, um, think, those are credits, credit hours, right? Um, think of those as being proportional to, to butts in seats, right? And so as of, um, the last time I did this data, the computer science unit was the second largest teaching unit on campus, having crushed through chemistry and physics and economics and psychology and all these other things, and only math was larger, and we have a bet with the math department head about when we'll catch up. And the problem is that people who come in our front door and add CS units, and also some <laughs> peers often also take math, so the bars are both moving at the same time. So, you know, I don't know. And of those units, about a, half of them are CS majors, people who will get a CS degree, a quarter of them are the rest of the engineering college, and a quarter of them are everybody else, right, which makes things very interesting. And so the first response both, you know, at the department level, the college level, and the institution level is what I've been referring to as the deep response, right? You go deep, you add more depth in the teaching staff, more depth in TAs, more maybe, you know, more undergrads to help you in labs and whatever you're allowed to use undergrads for for TAs, more classes, more seats in the sections and more sections of the classes, more faculty. And I'm, I'm you know, the, the, the substance of, of today's talk is basically that this is a, a good response and a necessary first response, but it's not sufficient response. There's, there's another kind of a response 
you can look at. And I always just like this picture of Steve Jobs at the introduction of the iPad in 2011, which is the wide response, which is taking the, the, uh, the core of the discipline more broadly, widely across the campus. So this lovely quote, it's technology married with the liberal arts, married with humanities that yields the results that make our hearts sing. Steve Jobs could sell this, right, in some, in some pretty compelling ways. So this is, the argument is there's a vision here that says, what if we think about the sort of the computing enterprise and now the computing and data enterprise is this incredible hub, right? This, this sort of platform, this infrastructure for enabling in a computational and quantitative way every other discipline across the full intellectual breadth of the campus. So, you know, we're good at hanging out with people who do science or STEM kinds of things, but, you know, analytics and, and uh, AI are disrupting, you know, you know, business and law, health and medicine is increasingly computationally enabled. Digital humanities is a very interesting thing. Art and design, right? Um, interesting, lots of, lots of uh, you know, con uh, big data disrupting social science, you know, lots of sort of societal social justice, community engagement kinds of, kinds of topics. What would it take to reposition the computer science unit and the sort of the computational partners on campus, you know, as the place you go to to sort of do this kind of thing? So this is the sort of the the, the high-level motivation for doing what we ended up calling CS plus X. Now, other people, I'll talk about the name in a little bit, but so we built a set of degrees, right? And one of the things I'm just gonna, I'm gonna you know, give away a little bit of the punchline here is the structure of these kinds of joint engagements is always going to depend very significantly on the structure of and the culture of, and I have to say it, sort of the way money flows across the boundaries of the institution that you actually want to put some, something together. So I'm gonna talk about how we set up CS Plus X at Illinois, and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna open up the box and show you like why all of the things in my ecosystem made this the right idea. If you're interested in doing something like this, you may have a different flavor of this. Right. So the Illinois CS Plus X degrees, let me say what they are not. They are not a minor in CS or a minor in X. They are also not a dual degree, which is in almost all circumstances two degrees, which is very expensive and a lot of time. They are quite literally a half of a CS degree and a half of an X degree offered as a bachelor's degree in the department of X. Okay, if you were to ask me in very, very great detail, they are 40% of the CS degree, 40% of the X degree, and 20% of the general education requirements that everybody everywhere has to take, but okay, half and half. Right, so it's literally half of the core of the CS department degree, half of the disciplinary X degree, and we let each department decide what those things are, sort of bolted together. And one of the things that was a design principle, and I'll explain why it was a design principle, is that when we started these things, it was the same CS core for all of the Xs. And we'll come back and we'll talk about that. That was a, des that was a design decision. Um, why go wide, right? So there's all of the positive stuff, you know, pick your favorite cover of your favorite, you know, you know, business or, you know, general publication that talks about, you know, data and big data and computation and stuff like that. That's this positive thing. You know, if you actually go far enough across campus to disciplines, you can find people whose enrollment curve looks like 1.0 minus yours, <laughs> okay? Um, the English department has half as many students as majoring in it as it had, you know, um, a decade ago. There are people that are under some significant duress, even in great universities, as, among other things, parental pressure on, why are you majoring in that? I know you love it, but there's no universe in which you're going to get a job when you're done with that. Right? There's lots of issues over there. So there are opportunities for, if you will, lifelines, right, you know, connections to other departments who are very interested in many cases in getting into the computational universe in some way and are just not exactly sure how to do it. All right. So positive pressures for doing this and negative pressures for doing this. Um, I need to give credit where credit is due. Um, Al Spector, um, who was a colleague at Carnegie Mellon, um, was one of the core implement designers of the Andrew File System way back in the day, left and spun it out as a company, ran Transarc, was the VP of research for Google for a number of years. I think he might have run Google X, you know, for a while. He's now running a hedge fund. Um, of course he is, um, in New York. <laughs> Big ass, yeah. Um, and um, Alfred published a, um, a, basically a blog post in Exconomy um, in 2012 basically saying CS plus X for all X, that this is the necessarily correct vision of how CS should, 
should be going. And it was actually a pretty good, good blueprint for this sort of thing. So I feel pretty good about the fact that we had already been designing the program for two years, right, when Al, when Al uh, pitched this. But Al's the person who pitched the name in a very broad, in a very, in a very broad kind of way in January 2012. And under um, oath, I would still testify that the fact that in February 2012 I bought all of the CS plus X domain names is completely unrelated to this timing. So, and then I gave them all to the University of Illinois. There are lots of CS plus X's being built, and depending on your flavor, there are X plus CS's, and there's all kinds of, all kinds of names for this. We have one. Um, our friends at Stanford have one. They made a lot more noise about theirs. Um, um, we can talk about the, you know, if you ask me some questions, we can talk about the, um, about the differences. Um, by way of context, at the University of Illinois, we had been running a pair of kind of CS plus X degrees for decades, right? We had two degrees that were offered in our local version of LSNA, Liberals, you know, uh, Literature, Science, and the Arts. Um, with the other sort of, you know, uh, liberal arts kinds of requirements on the degree. And I know that you guys also have a, an LSNA version of, you know, of the degree over there. We had two, and one of them was with the math department with, that more or less was most of, but not all of, the CS curriculum and all of the electives are replaced by required math classes. And another one where, where instead of math classes, they were statistics classes. So we already had at least an inkling that it's kind of possible to do something like this. Right? But what we did was take a larger step back and say, if we really wanted to engage more broadly, and, and you know, the, the mathematicians and the statisticians, they don't look that different from us, right? what would we actually have to do? And so we went out and we recruited some partners, and the partners we ended up recruiting were all in the same college, and I'll talk about why that was a good thing in a little bit. Um, and we got anthropology, astronomy, chemistry, and linguistics, right? which is an interesting kind of a spanning breadth you know, of, of kind of players. The design on the curriculum started in 2010. It was approved in 2013 for this set of degrees in this, in this college. Admissions started in 2014, and just as of um, a month ago, we have the class of 2017, you know, the admission class of 2000, we have, the, for the first time, we have the full four-year pipeline in operation. We have actually graduated some people, right? Um, <coughs> Now, one of the things that I just need to sort of remind everybody about is in a large public institution like mine and like yours, the regulatory apparatus, the number of steps that you have to go through to do something like build a new degree is not small. And I am, because I like you guys, I am not going to read anything else on this slide, <laughs> right? But um, this was the, you know, look, I mean, you know, how exciting is levels of governance for program and curricular changes, right? Um, and the thing that I'm circling there is that's the row of stuff that we, those are the, he, the hurdles we had to jump through, the committees we had to talk with, you know, and all of this kinds of stuff to basically build this thing. So it took basically three years, right, from sort of concept to um, implementation and then another year before we were allowed to start recruitment, right? So I th we are now able to do this much faster because we've been through this pipeline, we know what the, what the problems are, but don't, don't discount for a minute um, the significant regulatory apparatus you actually got to go through to do this kind of stuff. So, there's this book that was really popular, and it's so popular that it's now has a 15th edition reissue that's everything I really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. I updated it because with respect to CS plus X, everything I needed to know I learned doing startup companies, right? So I'm going to put my entrepreneur guy hat on, because I've done a bunch of startup companies, and just talk about it from, from that point of view. So, time to market matters. <laughs> okay, for getting your stuff out. So we optimize much about the design of this curriculum to be able to move it through the regulatory apparatus as fast as possible and to be able to get it out of professors' hands with the approvals to into the regulatory apparatus. And that is one but not the only reason for getting, for building the, building the architecture as there is one common core curriculum, right? Um, so there was a very elaborate, complicated set of faculty meetings where we talked about this and we said, we want to put a common core together and we want us to all agree that if they take this much, we will regard them as a computer scientist peer. And you can imagine that the sort of the pushbacks were all, but, 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 that means you're not going to require my class. You can you exactly know what this was and what we said was, but, 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 that's correct. Yeah, actually we're not. And we said, look, we know how to build a computer scientist. We have no lack of demand 
for building another computer scientist. I'm trying to figure out how to build a computational anthropologist. Right? Do they need this course? Right? And how much of this stuff do we need? And you know, the first version of this came out a little heavy, right? Because we needed to get the faculty to, to be comfortable with this, but it came out solid, right? And once we were done with it, we could say, this is it. We are going to take this as the template for all of the subsequent degrees because I got the faculty to buy into this. I don't have to negotiate this again, right? Now, to be, well, I'm gonna talk about this again in a, in a, in a second. Right, in a startup company, you spend all of your time talking about minimum viable product. It doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be best, it has to be good enough to get in the marketplace and get some, some money, some customers, some eyeballs, or whatever. We talked about minimum viable degree. This is the substance of there is one common core. This is it. This is the minimum viable CS degree. We all have agreed on it, you know, stop arguing about it. We're now going to talk about what the minimum viable anthropology, the minimum viable linguistics, and the minimum viable crop science is. So this was super helpful. And it's just like doing a startup company. You need a pitch that looks just like a venture pitch. You know, it's just like the nasty venture capitalist on Sand Hill Road who I have actually pitched. It's 15 minutes long. It has a value proposition for why this is good. You know that slide with the hub and all that stuff? That's, that's where that stuff came from. Um, it has a team. Why should you do it with us? We're University of Illinois CS. We're ranked number five. We're big, we're bad, we're cool. You know, who else are you gonna do? Um, it has a business model for how we all make money, or more precisely, how we don't lose money, <laughs> right? And what are the upsides? Why should you do this with us? Why should you do it now? And just like a startup company, you need to find early adopter customers. You need to find people who are just crazy enough, right, to put some of their students in this underspecified, ill-designed, metastable curriculum, right, and provide the support systems, right, advising and emotional support so that when something weird happens, and something weird is always going to happen, they're there because they're feeling privileged and excited and happy to be part of this crazy experiment, and if something didn't work, no, that's okay. We'll just apologize and say, what do you think we should do next time? So we had to find the reason we got those X's were that those were the X's that actually returned our phone calls. Right, those were the X's who actually had people in leadership positions. So why did we do computational anthropology? That feels like a hell of a stretch. The associate dean for social sciences in the College of Liber Liter Literature, Sciences, and the Arts was a computational anthropologist. Okay, why did we do computational linguistics? Well, hell, we knew all of those people anyway. Why did we do computational chemistry? Because the, one of the uh, biggest and most powerful faculty members in the um, uh, Department of Chemistry, um, and I had the same personal trainer. <laughs> and I talked to her one morning, you know, while, while, you know, while humping iron, you know, and, and she said, um, we have to be in this. We have, to, we, we have to be in this. And I have this really cool one-line email from the head of the chemistry department that said, please let me be an X. Right? So you had to get early, in, and you had to get faculty inside the X's who really, really want you to be there and really, really want to do this with you. And if they don't want to call you back, and if they're kind of standoffish, and if they're just not sure if you want to do it, don't put your money there. Don't spend time there. They'll come by later when everybody else in the block is, is, um, is trying to do it. And finally, we had a business model. And I was very new at Illinois when we started talking about this. I didn't have a really good idea. And my dean helped me out with this. So this is the part where I said the, the, the financial exigencies are going to shape this a lot. Illinois is a place with differential tuition. There is a, a small amount of tuition to be an Illinois resident. There's a big amount of tuition to be a not Illinois resident. There's a slightly bigger number to be an international um, person. It is about $5,000 a year more expensive to be an engineer than it is to be an anthropologist. This, there's a similar number for, for business, there's a similar number for ag and stuff like that. And so the business model, and I owe this completely to, to my former dean, he said, we will split it with them. And the argument was, we are not cannibalizing anything. You know, it's not like there were a lot of anthropologists who were deciding, nuclear engineering, anthropology, nuclear engineering, anthropology, uh, anthropology, okay? Um, we're not going out, we're not doing anything. We are bringing new people in, and yes, we are doing something that's going to be a little odd for our friends in the liberal arts. We are charging a lot more money for this, but this is an incredible value kind of proposition in terms of, you know, 
intellectual upside and, you know, and uh, employment opportunity, and they keep half and we keep half. And I said, I, that's brilliant, right? And he said, yeah, that's why I'm the dean. So that's how we do it. These are a couple of slides from the original value prop pitch, you know, in late 2010, you know, we talked about, you know, there's CS and there's, you know, a new degree that would be CS and X and, you know, general education and, you know, how we split it and, you know, the mechanics and, you know, this was the first pro proposal for the, for the courses and stuff like that. Um, and to first order, we have the same, you know, CS courses in, you know, the, the same core. It's a little different in the, in the CS plus X degree and in our degree. So it's, in, this is, um, it's moving around a little bit. Intro programming, software studio, um, discrete math, prob stat for CS data structure, systems programming, digital design and architecture, programming languages and algorithms. And one of the biggest things that we did was get faculty buy-in over a lot, a lot of faculty meetings that this was an appropriate spanning basis. Right now, you can disagree with this, okay? And it's easy to do so. And you know, in an ideal universe, I would absolutely be building a custom curriculum for every one of the X's, right? I would be building some brilliant blended experience in the freshman year, you know, that was half anthropology and, you know, and half this, and I would be, you know, I would be pivoting to a few more, you know, nuanced design classes, you know, in the upper curriculum, and I would have sort of, you know, joint, joint um, um, senior projects or something, you know, at the other end, and if I was doing that, I would not actually have almost 15 CS plus X's, right, today. I would never have any of this stuff done. So, is this the best curricular design I could think of? No. Is this the fastest curricular design I can think of? Yes. So do you see this ever evolving, in re not custom to every X, but maybe custom to the, yes. the three classes of X? Yes, hold, hold, um, ask me that question when you see my categories of X slide Great. in 10 yeah. slides. Right. Yes. So, yes? Who's teaching um, The same people who are teaching the CS courses because these people are not taking any different classes. So you sit in the intro programming class and you look to the left and there's an electrical engineer and you look to right and there's an anthropologist. And so how many more students does this have to be? Not a lot. Um, hold, hold that thought when I show you this, some slides with some numbers. But I mean, as a, just a, a little prelude to that, the math in this, the math is, math is, CS math is big, but we've been doing it for a long time. CS statistics is small, but is rapidly growing because that whole data thing, they look, they, their growth curves look just like ours. The exponent is a little lower and the delay lag is about three years later, but they look exactly like our curves, right? It is not in the nature of the anthropology or the astronomy department to be big, right? So hold that thought. I'll, I'll get back to that. So, we got the solid foundation of CS, like, like some theory, software, hardware, all this sort of nice, uh, nice stuff, and then we said, go do some X. It's a simple, it's a little bit simple-minded, but it, but it had the goal of get there fast. So, it has some weird side effects. So, like, Rob, are you really making the anthropologist take computer architecture? Yes. Can, can you elaborate? I mean, the motivation seems yes. to be Um, because if I actually had to build a separate curriculum for every degree, I would have to do a separate 3.5 year review cycle and approval cycle for every degree, and I would have to design and staff 10 different curricula for 10 different X's. And because of this, I don't. In fact, because of this, every X that wants to be an X in the College of, Liter of Liberal Arts and Sciences can just be an X without additional approvals. At least one. Which is? Actually, astronomy. Right? I mean, what those people do often is crash galaxies into each other on craze. Yeah. Now, actually, hold that thought as well. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to cut now. All right. So, uh, let me give you a partial answer. Do the anthropologists need that? No. Right? No, 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 no. So, here's something I completely did not expect. The leadership in liberal arts was humongously positive about this, right? And what they said was, wow, we really like the fact that you are not watering this down for us at all, not even a little, right, to accommodate our students. Like, we love this. 
Is this going to be the broadest avenue of, anth of, 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 of curriculum to get anthropologists in the game? No. Fully agree. Okay? The people who get through this, are they going to be awesome? Yes. I mean, really, seriously awesome, interesting people. Is this the best way of doing that? Uh, you know? But, but um, this was cool. We totally did not expect, we, we expected some pushback. Didn't get it. Yeah. Very good question, Rob. So is the first approximation is the CS part of the CS plus X is basically the required core of CS yeah. minus all electives. Yeah, more or less. Slow away all the electives. To first, to first order. We did lighten up some of the math stuff. I mean, some of the math prereqs at the freshman level are sometimes there to enable you to get to some more advanced kinds of mm -hmm. stuff. I think we killed the 3D calculus. I think we dialed the linear algebra back to a somewhat simpler one. I think we may have dialed the probability back, but then later on we ended up building our own probability class because we weren't happy with the one the statistics department was doing, and I think we substituted it, but, but yes. Right, so um, you know, how did that work? Well, you know, here's, you know, here's some, some interesting stuff. So let me just tell you about anthropology, astronomy, linguistics, and statistics. Um, a, year old, a year old data. Um, approximately 11% of the anthropology department, 25% of the astronomy department, 28% of the linguistics department, and 36% of the statistics department are now X. Are those additive? Like the blue pie was there before and you've added an orange pie? Th that's a little difficult to sort of answer. We have for at least a couple of these departments, um, I think um, linguistics was growing by itself. But um, the data that we did, which is a little squishy, but was that for anthropology and astronomy, it was additive, that those departments were not on growth trends, and the only reason that there, are, that there was any growth at all was, was because of us. Um, statistics tells us that probably within five years, they will be mostly X. So this is what, some, you know, what the, the, the demand side looks like at a, at a, at a very high level. Um, you know, so what does like, the data structures course look like, which tends to be the first place where so look, we all teach a gigantic number of, in, of programming courses, and we teach courses that, you know, for the majors, we teach outward-facing courses, we teach a STEM version of the course for, like, the chemists, we teach a, a version of the course for the business school, right? Data structures tends to be, if you will, um, in some sense, the make or break between, no, I'm, I'm serious about computer science as opposed to I'd like to learn how to program a little bit, right? And this is what it looks like. You know, CS is still, you know, by, by far the, you know, the not biggest thing, but CS plus X is a big chunk. Our ECE friends are, are a larger department, and they started making everybody take the data structures class, which you know, makes some sense. And then other is just everybody else who's decided that this seems to be the make or break between me getting a Google job and me not, <laughs> right? And so, and so there they are. But even as you go very high, like the databases course on the, on the left of the right side and data mining, you, know, you see some CS plus X stuff starting to show up. And those are not required courses. Those are you know, things that people, people can take. Did you have miners going on there or the others? Um, we, so, um, Oh, everything else. Oh, no, we have no restrictions on who can take the you have to be paper. Serious to be taking your advanced courses. So the the without getting that, you get a star on your degree. Um, the the big thing that that pre, I'm, I'm assuming you guys have probably seen this effect as well. I, I've had this conversation with my friends at at, at Berkeley a lot, um, at Stanford at MIT. Um, there is the rise of what you can call the soft or undeclared minor, right? And it basically goes like this. Um, there seems to be a set of classes in a particular order that might get me a job at a cool, kind of a big data company. And that set of classes looks like this. I need to learn how to program. I need to know what a data structure is. I need to know how algorithms work. And then maybe I need some math on the side to fill in whatever the gaps that make it possible for me to finish those, to finish those courses. Um, would that get you a minor in my school? No. Um, we do not have um, this, and this is again the, this question about how, how the logistics works. We do not have, um, people do not have to declare minors to be pursuing minors. Um, this is the worst of all possible architectures because then you get people who say, I need this course, you have to let me into this course because I can't get the minor unless I get this course. And we said, now, now you're telling us? Right? So we have no mechanism of declaring, we have no mechanism of vetting, we have no mechanism of tracking, and it doesn't get you any enhanced um, uh, 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 priority or rank to get into a class. So it's stupid. Um, but it's mostly, are some of these people minors? Absolutely. Are most of them? No. Most of them are doing this soft kind of, I think this skill set is going to make my life a better, a better thing. So a year ago, things looked like this. You know, CS plus X was approaching 30% of all CS. CS plus X was approaching 50% of all admitted freshmen. 
and the CS plus X degrees were 28% uh, female, which was pretty good. Now, I have to say that th I would normally have said that that was pretty good, but we, be because CS is incredibly popular, because we've been doing a lot of other things just in the core CS stuff, CS plus S is 46% female, just straight up CS. We're approaching straight up gender parity. Um, and, it, and people ask me, how did you do that? And I said, well, by mostly not doing stupid things. Um, and they ask me, and I can tell you about some of the stupid things. But I, I, you know, this sounds kind of snarky, but uh, um, there's not that many schools in the top five. <laughs> um, and Stanford is only going to get so big, and MIT's, you know, um, the number of undergrads at MIT is two times the number of students in my department, my former department. Um, Carnegie Mellon is great, but still kind of small. They're growing, but they are still small, even though they've almost doubled, right? And that leaves only two places that are safety valves that have seen ex really, really exponential growth, and that's us in Berkeley, right, in the, in the very, very top ranks. And so, you know, it, hel it helps. Um, so what's the next interesting thing that happens? Um, and the next interesting thing that happens is that the ignition of a few CS plus Xs creates a whole lot more demand for people who want to, want to get in the game. So this is what the landscape looks like um, right now. Um, we have approved, which means the X unit has approved and the CS department has approved CS plus crop science, CS plus advertising, CS plus philosophy, CS plus music, and CS plus geoscience, right? My faculty has voted and said yes. The faculty of those, those um, departments has voted and said yes. Some of these have actually made it all the way. Crop science is approved all the way up at the state level. And music, I think, is now all the way approved up at the state level. And those are, interestingly enough, crop science is in a different college, right? And so crop science had to do that whole elaborate set of regulatory things because it's not liberal arts. And music is a different, yet a different college, and so it had to do all of that elaborate stuff. Um, geoscience and philosophy are in the same college, so the hope is that the, this, they, they are the test case of, we already approved the platform, can we just go? Oh, I missed one. Economics is actually approved by the faculty as well. But education, after the individuals there had a big national election thing, the political science department came to us and said, um, I think we need to be an X. Can I ask a quick question on these? So it, Please. Among all these departments, how many of them are sort of comparable in rank to the rank five CS? Or is this always a case where you are the golden child coming, bringing the, you know, sort of a wonderful, shiny rank five gem? This is, an, this is an excellent question. So, um, crop science is, is, the ag school tends to be like number, uh, top five, and crop science is, a, is an apex predator, right, um, in, its, in its space. Um, the geoscience department is pretty good. Um, I think the others are, are okay, but not, but not, top, not top 10, right. Um, and one of the things that I, 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 I've always said um, is, um, because of the way we did the business model, all of these are a bachelor's degree um, of, and we have to, you get to decide what the name is, um, offered by and owned by the Department of X, right? That has been humongously helpful. Because that does two things. So one is, there's a bunch of other financial sort of apparatus around owning the major that um, we just don't get involved in. So, you know, that happens. And the fact that we split the tuition bump up, most of these places are not in places that have tuition and differentials that are nearly as big. But the, the thing that's been the most interesting is that um, for almost all of these engagements, um, um, I've gotten just a gigantic, me and my, my former management team in the department, just gigantic amount of positive vibes back, right? In many cases, these people say, this is the first time like a set of power players from the College of Engineering ever came over to my office and was nice to us. You know, and either, either is possible. <laughs> you know, and they just said this is the first time somebody ever came over and like reached across and said, "Shake my hand, let's jump off this interesting cliff together," and treated us like a peer with a business model that made us come out good, which was remarkable. And I tell people that some of the funnest meetings some of just the coolest meetings that I've ever had have been parachuting into these places. So, you know, we parachuted into the art, the art and design, you know, folks. Um, and 
there's like literally no joke here. Here's my team on this side of the table and here's the art and design team. We are the only people in the room not wearing black and not without, and without visible tattoos. <laughs> right? um, and we discover there are some tremendous commonalities. You know, they say, you know, we feel some kindred spirit because you teach gigantic outward facing service classes peopled with passionate students who will never be a professional in the discipline. Uh, um, oh, yeah. And they said, and we teach product design things, right, um, that are really great design, fun courses for us to teach and are part of our business model for how we pay the bills, and they are populated by engineers. And I said, oh, and they said, you didn't know that? I said, no, and they said, oh, no, there's tons of engineers in our classes. So of course we ought to be doing something together. So, yeah. Was business one of the counter examples to the, the, the tuition differential? Business is one of the examples to the, it was the counter example. Business is the one, the ag school has a medium size um, bump. The business guys, the bump is just about the same size as us. And it wasn't until the business school actually had a leadership change um, with a much more outward facing you know, dean. And I had a great conversation with the business school. So just, just to share this, he said, look, we have the number one ranked or number two ranked accounting department. What do accountants do? What do CPAs do? They <coughs> trudge through gigantic amounts of data looking for patterns. <laughs> Low. And in the language of the dean of a business school, he said, we need to run up the value chain really, really fast, <laughs> or there's going to be no there there in the accounting degree. Right? Some deep network is just going to go in and go Enron. Right? So, um, really, really interesting conversations with, with all of these people. Um, this is what one of the, one of the new curricula um, looks like. This is, this is crop science. Um, um, the crop science guys came in with an, an incredible kind of narrative, you know, for why, we wanted, why they wanted to do this. They said, look, what's the future of crop science all about? Data, right? You know, people are looking at satellites and people are measuring things on tractors and stuff like that. We're drowning in data. Cyber physical, farmers do not really drive tractors anymore. Robots are going to be driving tractors. Drones are going to be flying around telling the robots how to drive the tractors. <laughs> we need to get in the game on that one. And you know that some of the biggest companies in the ag space are primarily genomics companies that tell you, you know, this very particular genetically engineered hybrid is what you should put. I mean, the, the fantasy on some of these things is that in every 10 meter by 10 meter square, you know, some robot tractor is driving, right, sampling, um, genetically sequencing, interrogating satellites to look at data and deciding how much whatever oop, you know, they, they spray on stuff, right? It's, it's data everywhere. Yeah? Data everywhere. If you were going to do this program again, would you replace your um, architecture course with a, more of a data analysis course? Hold that you and you. Hold that, hold that, hold that to the next slide. I can learn. I can learn. Hold that to the next slide. What about two architecture courses, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> We used, to have, we, used, we used to have two architecture courses, and I, I, I apologize to all of to my, my brothers and sisters. We used to have two. We dialed it back to one. Okay, so, so um, you know, you look on the left-hand side, and you see what the, you know, what the, what the crop guys are. So, yeah, what's the core of, you know, computer science is probably some math and, you know, programming data structures, you know, maybe a structures course, you know. What is it for crop sciences? Weed science, no jokes, please. Applied, you know, weeds, bugs, and weeds, bugs, and leaves. <laughs> right? you know, this is what those guys. This is what those guys. This is what those guys do. Yeah, Karen. So I have a few questions. I have a okay. <laughs> so the the Hexi S part is now service to the CNS department, correct? It's like well, I mean, but the that's what you're doing for these other departments. You're doing service. Yeah. Well, service suggests somehow that it's some kind of a lesser no, kind no, of a what kind I'm of a course. Is you're adding students. Yes, we're adding, so, we're adding so students. Add more departments, you yes. Know, the number of students you're going to have to serve. Right, and right. It would have resource yes. requirements. Yes. That's number two. Um, is there a disconnect between the CS part and the X part? In other words, the, they teach the X part kind of like they have always taught it, and what they've learned is the CS part. How do they merge? They're, um, one of the, I think the, the most salient criticism that one could offer is that they are not very deeply connected. So the upside of the way we built this is um, um, the sort of, if you will, the lean curriculum design part was as quickly as we could do it that allowed us to launch and capture customers and eyeballs, 
right? I think the, the thing that's not as good is I would love an integrated design experience, you know, kind of in all of these things. And I would love, um, you know, at least one like freshman experience of like, why is this thing, these things coming together? The hope is that as these things launch, get bigger and get more stable, we'll be able to build a few of those kinds of things. Right, but you know, I mean, nothing is perfect. I mean, and I'm, I, you know, there are efforts spinning up that are starting by building integrated design experiences and, and building more curriculum. I think those will be rich and exciting. I think they will not be numerous. I think that's just the way that's, that's gonna work. We made the different trade-offs. So, one size fits all is the way we do it right now. We are looking right now at bifurcating. This is the answer that everybody wanted to say. Basically a STEM side CS plus X and a non-STEM side you know, CS plus X, right? So the STEM side CS plus X will keep the computer architecture course and will keep, you know, a little more of a vision of the iron, you know, going down, you know, going down to the bottom. Um, but the non-STEM side is going to go, I mean, literally, um, well, this is like art, education, music, philosophy, and stuff like that. Um, what's literally gonna do, it's gonna go up the stack. It's gonna do exactly what you think it's going to do. So the STEM side stuff will make you take an architecture class, will make you take a systems programming class, you know, you know, you know, you never know when somebody on the STEM side is going to need to do an embedded system and, you know, and touch an interrupter, you know, or do that kind of stuff. The non-stuff stuff, it's going to go up the stack and it's going to spend a little more time in maybe interfaces space, maybe HCI space, maybe databases space. So we literally said, literally, how about we swap out the architecture class in its current form, which is like the, the Hennessy and Patterson baby book, you know, kind of class. Um, and we're going to swap in a course that has more of the flavor of the Bryant O'Halloran um, you know, kind of book, CS uh, uh, 15 to 13, it's, uh, it's kind of Mellon for those of you who know what that is, right? And maybe we should make them take the databases class, <laughs> right? Um, and so this is actually sort of underway and, you know, part of this, part of this kind of curricular design stuff. So, um, and some of the new degrees, the anchor degrees in the, new, in the new colleges, because they are not, because they don't have to have exactly the template, the standard template of the liberal arts science sciences degree, we can, we can pivot a little bit. We're confident people are a little more comfortable with making those choices. But when we started this in 2010, you know, you go to war with the faculty you got, right? You know, um, having the architecture class there was a, was a showstopper for a big chunk of my very hardware sensitive kind of, CS at Illinois faculty, and so, you know, there's an architecture course. <laughs> so, and so the other observation, because you're doing this in new colleges, you bought the three and a half year process anyway, you might as well do it. Yeah, but now it's not three and a half years. Now it's more like one year. Okay. We've just gotten really good at, like, you need to do this for this committee, you need to do this, you know, here's the template, here's the last three of these things we did. And you know which three did. things are gonna And you know which three things, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and every time you still get surprised, but yeah. Um, the other thing I was just going to answer, um, I can't remember if it was Karim or Trev, um, um, like how big is this stuff? Um, I'm going to go back to my, um, you're never supposed to go back in the talk, but I'll just show you this. Um, look, um, the total number of students in like, you know, um, astronomy and linguistics and stuff like that, it's like another hundred students in the three years of the pipeline. So maybe 120 or something like that. It's a rounding error, right? Look, it is not in the nature of an anthropology department to be big. The computer science department has 1,700, 1,800 undergrads at the moment. The astronomy department has 100. Okay, so when I tell you 25% of the astronomy department is X, I'm telling you there are 25 students. So is that a big deal to the computer science department? No. Is that a big deal to the astronomy department? Hell yes. Okay, now, the thing that's new is the economics department is not small. The crop science department is not small. The business school is not small, right? So in some sense, you know, what we've done is we've piloted this in small, small cohort, you know, kinds of, you know, kinds of, kinds of venues. Now, you know, we are talking about gating functions to get people into larger, larger things. I mean, the, the economics department had called me up and said, I promise that you, we will start small. We will only admit 300 into the CS plus economics. And I was like, Marty, I'm, call me back, call me back. We have subsequently decided for that one that we won't admit them into CS plus X at all. We'll admit them into economics. We will ask them to take a few courses and demonstrate their interest. And then we will ask them to apply to transfer sideways into CS plus, into CS plus X. And then we will be able to control gating. But you know, this is another modality of the department going big that we're gonna have to figure out. But we didn't start with that. 
Can I ask a question specifically yeah. about that transfer model? One yeah. of the things that we've had concerns about with transfer models is that it would create competitive pressures, especially if it's GPA-based, yeah. which could poison the environment for the students such that they actively try to cause others to do worse to enhance their chance of getting it. Have you seen anything like that? Are you worried Not yet. about that? Yeah, we're worried about all of this. The other thing that I'll admit that we worry about is as soon as you have a lot of doors into the CS curriculum, you have back doors into the CS curriculum. I didn't get into the CS degree and I didn't get into the CS math degree. So uh, I didn't even really know what anthropology is, but I'm gonna declare myself to, have to be to love anthropology. And then you get in and then you transfer in sideways. And so how do you, and then they do well in these classes, right? And so how do you say no? We started um, talking about things like, um, to transfer out of a CS plus X into the core CS, one answer might just be no, right? I mean, the other answer might be, sure, I need you to show me that you got an A in the four core anthropology classes. I need to show me that you weren't lying to me that, you know, and it's okay if you took the four anthropology classes and then decided it's just not for you. But, you know, I, I don't want to be, we don't want to be gamed. And I don't, have, I don't have a great answer. I mean, this is, at some point, this becomes like a really interesting problem of mechanism and incentive design. And, and there are going to be some places where you just don't get it right. Yeah. Can you talk about Um, 70 tenure line faculty as of this semester, um, and about 15 teaching faculty who are assistant, associate, or full teaching professor. Yeah. No, they don't. Well, no, that's false. They teach. They don't teach the lower level courses. They teach. They teach. We share networking. We share operating systems. We share, you know, some system stuff um, a little higher up the stack. So in the elective universe, yes. In the core universe, no. And many of the CS plus X courses are required courses, and they're huge. Because if you remember those pie charts, the CS oh, yeah. stuff is not even, we're not even remotely the, the biggest actors there. Many of those are already owned by professional teaching faculty because of the scale at which they run. They run 1,000 people a semester. Yeah. How do you manage enrollment priorities? Does a student's major impact that? Um, the, sh the short answer is we don't control, so um, um, you apply to the College of Engineering and you, you declare your major. Um, the enrollment decisions happen at campus level. We don't, Sorry, we don't do it. I mean admissions. I meant enrollment in an class. Oh, classes yeah, yeah. And, um, and their wait list sure, sure. Um, if you are in CS or any of the CS plus X's, you have the highest priority. If you are, if you are, um, a computer engineer in the ECE program, you are at the, you are at the highest priority because you have some requirements. Everybody else is somewhere else further down the priority list. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's. So in particular, a CS plus X student would have the same priority as a CS yeah, student. Yeah, yeah. Even for, say, the data mining class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, we, we've, made a, we've made a cultural decision that, you know, if you're a CS plus anything, you're us. We're, we're going to treat you like us. So there was, a, there was a joke about, you know, all of your freshmen have, have, a, have a shirt. All of our CS people have a shirt that says CS plus, and we list all of the X's on the back. Um, I was going to talk for, for just about two seconds about just the one other way of going wide, right? Because um, I know you guys have some serious game in this space as well. Um, we've been building a, a master's degree in data science. Um, and it's a MOOC-based degree, so it's on the Coursera platform. Um, and this is a three-way play. This is the computer science department, which is doing sort of the platform stuff, the cloud stuff, database data mining and machine learning, the statistics department doing just what you think they'd be doing, and the iSchool, which is doing the whole data lifecycle, curation, stewardship, provenance, you know, when is it okay to throw it away, the legal, ethical, and regulatory language, you know, a, a framework around, around data. Um, and this thing we, we put together. Um, Daphne uh, uh, Collar at, at Coursera was, was, you know, pounding on me like, you know, when are you, gonna, when are you guys going to do a degree like Georgia Tech? Um, because we are under the same set of duresses in growth as you guys are, right? What I said was, I don't have the assets to be able to pull out of core teaching to build, to build this curriculum. Um, but I could put the three-way set of assets together to build, a data, to build a data science thing because then I don't have to teach all of this stuff myself, which also made it possible for me to bring some people that I like and would like to work more with sort of inside the tent. 
And you know, uh, most of us are someplace in this space, right? You know, you guys are certainly in Coursera space. You were one of the not not the founding four. Uh, were you one of the founding four? Yeah, you were one of the founding four. We were the next the next cohort in. Um, um, you, I use, and, and I know you guys have been doing some edX stuff lately with some other, other campus level, you know, kinds of stuff. We were in the next cohort in, so we're in, uh, we're in Coursera space. Um, uh, CMU is, still remains the odd, the odd, the odd duck out. They don't really have any macro engagement with that, so it'll be interesting to see whether they make any changes going forward. Um, I teach in this space as well. Um, I'm the person who dragged um, Illinois into, the, into this game because all of my peers at Stanford were the people building this stuff out. So I, I made a lot of noise in 2012 and got us to join the, join the platform. I've been teaching a VLSI CAD class um, um, ever since. And it's now on the autonomous version of the platform where about every two months it just, it just queues up and launches again. So it's a small and obscure course by Coursera standards and only has 10,000 people in it. Um, um, for those of you who know about VLSI CAD, it's not exactly the world's largest industry, right? It's about a five or seven billion dollar marketplace. There are about 25,000 professionals on the planet who do VLSI CAD, or as it's now called electronic design automations. And of those 25,000, this course has reached 57,000 of them <laughs> to date. <laughs> so, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, maybe that was just you, John. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. You are, you are. Um, so I am personally pretty committed to this as like, uh, I think this is a good thing to do for people like us to get, get things out into the universe. Um, we're a big partner. We're, I think, Coursera's third largest academic partner. Um, you know, like 23 million Coursera users, 2.6 million in Illinois courses, 52,000 paid, 650 degree students. Um, there are almost a million people who've registered for um, computer science MOOCs to date. I mean, it's, 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 it's a big monetary monetization opportunity. The very first degree on the Coursera platform was the Illinois MBA, which is pretty cool, and they've been spending a lot of time with that. The second degree on the platform was our um, MCSDS, Master of Computer Science in Data Science. And we have 150 in the first cohort. Of course, they said, why not 1,500? And we said, stop, stop talking to us. Um, we are aiming for, um, you know, three or four K, you know, um, we're aiming for a Georgia Tech size pipeline. We'll see if we, we'll see if we get there. And, you know, the market says it's a, it's a big thing. Um, we have already built a bunch of courses that are operating on the Coursera platform that are doing this. Coursera has made a pivot away from, and most of the MOOCs have done this, away from courses that look exactly like college courses. They don't all start at the same time and they're not all either 10 or 15 weeks long right now. Um, Coursera did a lot of research and said, you know, courses ought to be maybe a month long or six weeks long. Why? That's how much focus people can have if you're a grown up and you have a job or, you know, you're trying to get out other stuff in your life. And they now are also trying to be autonomous, which means the professor doesn't have to be involved after you set it up. So you can just, you can just run them and they just, they just like launch the first of every month or every eight weeks or something. And my course is now on that platform. It just, it just runs and I don't get bugged after the first shakeout where things crashed, right? Like, like software. Um, so this is just you know, one example of, of like what something looks like. The, the current degree is 32 units. It's eight courses. It costs 600 bucks a unit, um, which puts the cost around $18,200, something like that. Um, uh, why did I charge $600 a unit? Because if I charged $601 a unit, I would have had to ask the Board of Trustees for approval. Right, so time to market, time to market, time to market. Simple, 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 you know. How big can I make it and not have to ask permission? That, okay, that's, that's why it costs. Um, the Georgia Tech guys charge very, very little for it. Um, they regret that now, if you actually talk about the $7,000 degree, they regret the way, that, the way they priced it. Um, every course that we, that we have on offer in the, in the degree is created as two MOOCs that are about a month or six weeks long for the lecture stuff, and then we require some engagement. We require them to do a final exam with us with proctoring, you know, that again can be done remotely or to engage remotely in a group exercise that's like a, like a design project or something. So there has to be something where humans touch it. And it's just, you know, it's just launching right now. Um, last, sem last semester, it's, it's scaling right now. So the, the macro architecture are these things that, that people call stackable degrees. You can go take an individual MOOC and say, hey, that was cool. 
right? And then you can extend it to a sequence of MOOCs and you get a specialization, you get a certificate, right? And you get something, you can put it on your, on your, on your LinkedIn page. And then you can say, you know, I think I, I might actually like to, like to get a degree. And then you can cycle back and say, what else do I have to do? What additional stuff do I have to do to take this sequence of MOOCs and get a course credit for this? Well, you have to engage with us. So, you know, gentle, gentle engagement. All right, so I love this quote. Data isn't fissile material. It doesn't spontaneously reach critical mass and start producing insights. All right, so I'm, I'm pretty convinced that, you know, it's sort of the computer science folks like us in this room, our friends in statistics and our friends in information science, like these are the people you got to get in the room to talk about trying to make data science. And you guys are all over this stuff. So, you know, we, we look at your curriculum pages and we, you know, we're, 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 we're in favor of everything you guys are doing. This is the, the, the Illinois angle on, on, you know, on trying to build this stuff out. So just the last slide is, you know, deep is good, you know, for a, for a CS department, but wide is also important. You know, there are a lot of opportunities to do plus X. There are a lot of opportunities to do things in, for example, you know, um, planetary distant learning technologies to take the message out wide. And of course, you're going to continue to go deep for your CS majors. There's, there's, there's not, there's no exclusivity. There's no either or. This is all additive. This is all more interesting things for us to do. And with that, I will say thank you. <laughs>